I thought it would be important for us to spend some time today talking about what the scriptures say about money and possessions and specifically giving. Now, depending what kind of family you grew up in or even what kind of church that you've been in, you might have heard a number of different things. And uh, because of that, people feel differently about money. And so as soon as we start, say the word money, it, it's heard a number of different ways. And people have different philosophies of what money is for and what money is meant to do. And I'll mention a few of them. And so a lot of these things come from your, your background, your family, your growing up, your current experience. A lot of times personalities have something to do with the way people think about money. We have a lot of people in the church into the Enneagram. There are certain types, certain numbers of the Enneagram that are more connected to certain philosophies about money than other types. It's really interesting. For some people, let me mention these. So for some people, money equals power. And I don't mean power in the sense that you have political power or that you have a lot of people under you. But I mean money can become influence and also control over your life. That's what money means to a lot of people. It makes me safe. It's secure. I have a sense of control that I wouldn't have if I didn't have this amount of money. So for some people, money is primarily about power. For others, money is primarily about pleasure. It's about comfort. It's about your quality of life. It's about the adventurous life you get to live. It's about the great cars that you get to drive or the vacations that you get to take or simply just having things that cause you not to have to worry about anything. This is one that's very common for most Americans because we have so much wealth uh, in comparison to the history of the world, that we are very much con connected to comfort and pleasure because of our wealth. Other people see money primarily as a means to put themselves in a position that validates who they are as a person. So this is how money can be used as status. It's a sign of success. That life, grown-up life, is a competitive sport. I grew up competing all the time, and when, you're, uh, when you love competing, it never stops. And so the amount of money you have can be the newest game that you're playing. Am I on top? Am I winning? Do I have more than I had last year? Do I have more than the people around me? Money can be one of those things. Now, here's the kind of the haunting thing. Money and a person and a person's soul are so complicated. And so we all have a degree of unhealthy, uh, unhealthy thinking when it comes to money. Maybe there's a little bit of the power, a little bit of pleasure, a little bit of this idea of our position in life. But what happens is when you come to know Jesus and you begin to follow him, he begins to mess with us in every area of our life. Isn't it true? Like literally everything. And what's nice about him is he usually gives it to us in doses that we can handle. Right now you're getting this. And then I'm going to challenge you to grow in this area. And then next year, you're going to hear from a friend this. And I'm going to challenge you through that friend. And you're going to grow in this area. But Jesus messes with every area of life, including what we think about money, possessions, and giving. And so there are other people that as they begin to follow Jesus, money becomes more about people. In the kingdom of God, money is meant to be used to care for people, real lives. It's meant to be invested in life change. It's used to uh, bring about justice where there isn't any, where people are being oppressed, silenced, forgotten. It's a great place to use your money, to care for people. Where there are those that need mercy, money is used to provide mercy. Money is used to invest in community because people are not okay on their own. It's used to facilitate faith because faith is when people truly are alive. In the kingdom of God, money is used for people. Now that video... The reason it fits really well today is it puts this whole conversation about giving and the fact that your church is raising money right now into context. What we are after is more stories like the ones that you just saw. We are after more people, more life change. And we want to make sure that there is always room for the next high school student that walks into our ministry. For the next couple who's struggling in their marriage. Or you can think of it this way. Think of yourself when you entered into this space. What was your life like? We want to make sure there's room for the next you. And so all of this is meant to be seen in the context of people and life change. Now, as we move along in this series, what we're doing each week is we're tracking with the movement of the Israelites as they left Egypt. A nation of slaves being moved to a kingdom of priests. And along the way, there are these big steps of faith. So a step into the sea. 
was our first week. So last week, Gene shared how they took a step into the desert, and it wasn't just about wandering. It was about learning to follow. That's a big step of faith. Today, we're going to see that Israel takes a big step of faith at the mountain. So some of you know the story, and some of you don't. Israel's been wandering around for a few weeks. God takes them to a mountain called Sinai. And there at Sinai, they would camp out for several days, several weeks. And God would begin to make a covenant with them. And you can think of, if you don't, aren't familiar with covenant, you can think of it this way. God was like marrying himself to Israel, pledging himself to them. It was like a marriage. And they would pledge themselves to him. But part of this pledging was that God was saying, I want you to be a unique type of people. And this is where he began to mess with every area of their life, including what they thought about money and finances. This was going to be a big step in helping form their character. And so the story occurs in Exodus chapter 19. You can read it behind me. It says, On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel comes down from the mountain after this long conversation, and he begins to communicate with the Israelites, the type of people there to be. And what's so neat about this passage is later in the chapter, chapter, they begin to pledge themselves to God. Whatever you have asked God, we will do. A choice of freedom to pledge themselves to God. Now, here's what you need to know a little bit about the book of Exodus. So Exodus rec uh, recounts the history of this movement through, from Egypt into the Promised Land. You have books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy that describe in detail the law, the instruction God was giving to Moses while at the mountain. So Exodus tells us they made it to the mountain. Le Le Leviticus and Deuteronomy give us like a very close look at what the conversation was actually like. And I want to point out some of the things that God begins to say about money. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 and this is the first thing I want to mention today. When it comes to giving, there are certain principles that help us. And I know that many of you are going home and, and you're doing exactly what we've asked you to do. We're asking you to pray and prepare how you might commit for two years to help us with Dream Boulder, to be a part of what's happening. These are two principles that I'm going to share today that are helpful in, in not just filling out your commitment card, but when you think about giving for the rest of your life. These are things that I've learned. These are things that I apply to my life. Elise and I, when it comes to our finances as a couple, these are things we teach our four sons. And we teach it to them as early as we can. And the first is we want to show you what, uh, this principle of what we give. And then second, we want to show you a principle of what we keep. So Levit Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, we get the first instructions about what it is that we're to give. Here's what it says. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And then it goes on to describe what happens if this tithe needs redeemed. But I just want you to notice verse 30. A tithe belongs to the Lord, and because of that, it is holy. So there are two important words here in understanding what it is that we give. First is the tithe. Second is this, this designation of it being holy. A tithe in Hebrew simply means a tenth or a tenth payment. Or you can think of it this way, 10%. I'm not very good at math, but a tenth, my sons tell me, is also 10%. Early on in the life of this brand new community who just weeks before were slaves that had nothing, had no future, Early on in this new development of this new people, this new culture, this new society, God takes Moses to the mountain and he says to them, they are to think differently about all that they have. So differently that the first tenth, the first ten percent of what they have is meant to be given back to God for the things that he is doing. Deuteronomy chapter 14 says the same thing. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that is in your fields and your produce. This is a tenth of all your earnings, your profits, your produce, your inheritance. Anything God ever entrusts you with, your tithe comes from that. Numbers chapter 18, we see that this tithe was meant to be for the entire community. So just a little background here before we read Numbers 18, but you can put it up there. You'll see in the passage there's this mention of a group of people called the Levites. 
The Levites are one of the, the 12 tribes. So there were 12 tribes of Israel that left Egypt together. And they were, just think of them like their own family, their own clan, even though they belonged to this great big nation. 11 of the 12 tribes would be given land. Every family was given land to farm so they could produce things, so they could care for themselves, have freedom to work, provide for their family. 11 of the 12 tribes were given land. But the tribe of the Levites were given nothing. Their job was to handle the affairs, the religious affairs, and the cultural affairs that were taking place in and around the temple. So they were to handle the spiritual life of the community. And their livelihood came through the, the giving, the tithe, the provision of the 11, other 11 tribes. Now get this, and we're going to get to this in a moment. Giving does something for the heart that nothing else will. And so even though the Levites have maybe the least amount of anyone, and all the things that they have are a uh, result of other people's giving. You see here in Numbers chapter 18 that even the Levites were called to give a tenth. Did God need it? Well, in a sense, he already had it. But why the Levites have to give is because God knew that there was something good for their heart that could come only through giving. There was a freedom that would come only through giving. Giving is meant to be something we all participate in. So whether you make a lot of money or a little bit, the 10% allows everyone to participate. I'm going to send a video out to our college students in a couple weeks. And I'm going to challenge them to be a part of Dream Boulder. Often college students say, I don't have any money, which is not true. They might have a little bit. The tenth is brilliant. The principle is brilliant because everyone is allowed to participate. Why would God do this? Because of the solidarity because he wants people to prioritize his kingdom, but also because God knew that giving does something for the heart that nothing else can. It frees us from the pull of riches. And so when you think about the tithe, there are different ways to describe the response to passages like this. And I will be uh, the first to admit today, this is challenging for a lot of people, including me. It can be challenging to think about 10%. My budget's so tight. There already seems to be so little. But the response that we're looking for anytime God speaks to us about specific things is faithfulness. It always is. It's always on us. So one of the things we promised you early on is that we would not manipulate you or use guilt to motivate you, which we are not going to do. But a lot of times when we hear God's instructions, we are convicted into faithfulness. And so this is what's happening. Israel is being challenged. If anyone had an excuse not to give, to hedge their bets, to care about their future to be really, really careful with what was going out, it would have been them. But God asked them to be faithful, and all of them were. Now, one thing that's really neat is that this principle of giving a tenth did not necessarily start right here at Sinai. This is the first time God is speaking it to a group of people, his covenant people, as a command. But it goes back into Israel's history, and there's a couple neat precedents of why people give even beyond being faithful and obeying. So the first comes in Genesis chapter 14 with Abraham. Some of you know this story. He wins a great battle. There's this other king that's nearby, and the king sees that Abraham wins this battle, and the king begins to praise and honor Abram, Abraham, and he begins to shower him with gifts. In the midst of this celebration of winning this great victory and how God had provided a victory and had even provided from this other king, we see in Genesis chapter 14, verse 20, Abram gave a tenth of everything he received that day. It was meant to be a recognition of God working in his life, of God being good for him. In Genesis 28... One of his descendants, a man named Jacob, has a dream. And in this dream, God promises Jacob the same kind of thing that he promises us today, and that is that he will provide. And Jacob makes this vow. He says, God, since you will promise to provide for me, I will give back to you a tenth of all that I have. And so when God is speaking to Abraham at the mountain, and Israel is asked to take this great big step of faith, many of them may have known these stories that the tithe is meant to be an act of gratitude and celebration for the fact that there is a God who is involved in our lives. Now this, long term, has always been more motivating to me than just being obedient. Because I can be a turd sometimes. 
and not want to obey. I can want to do things my own way. But the idea of denying that God has moved towards me personally, that he's blessed me, that he's given me skills, that he's given me a job to have, that he's given me a family, that we have a home, that we provide for our kids, that we get to do fun things. All of those things are blessings from him. And so the gift, the tithe that is given back from at least the Carlucci's is always meant to be a celebration of God present in my life, in our lives. Here's a neat story I heard just a couple weeks ago. Um, so many of you know all the neat things that we're doing in Uganda. And uh, I, I was able to visit there last June. And I've never been anywhere in the world where I've seen this type of poverty. So I've been in cities, and I've seen the urban poor. And I've seen the poor around slums. But I have never, ever seen the rural poor in a third world country. It was different. There were people um, living uh, apart from all... Um, Modern technology, modern innovations, separate from all of those things. There were people that we met that were part of the church that we're supporting that go through an entire year without ever exchanging currency or money. Just imagine that. That's what life is still like for some people in places like that. I mean, they, those people literally just work every day to try to survive. Well, this fall, Pastor David, who is the, kind of the leader of this whole thing that's going on in the school, the homes for the widows and the orphans, the church, the wells that are being dug. I mean, it's just amazing work. He was with us. And uh, we, we had an idea that we were going to move ahead with Dream Boulder uh, this spring. And he said, how is it that you're going to get your people to give? And I said, oh, I'm going to challenge them to be faithful to God. And I looked at him. I said, do you challenge your people? Because you're a pastor. Do you challenge your people to be faithful to God? And he said, no, I haven't. He said, they don't have anything. And, I, and uh, one of the other guys that was with us, one of our leaders here at Cornerstone, said, everyone has a little bit. Challenge them to give and see what happens. Well, a few weeks ago, we were told that um, this church goes around to different uh, districts in Uganda, where, places where the gospel is not really known. There's not a lot of believers. And they feed people, and they, they dig wells for them, and then they, they show up, and they begin to tell people about Jesus. This last outreach that they did was completely funded by their own church, people who gave. There's probably a lot of filled corn, disgusting filled corn, mangy chickens, weird-looking goats, because they were everywhere, but people gave what they had. And he was so proud, and those people were so proud that they were able to contribute. See, the tithe is meant to be for all of the free people of God celebrating their freedom and what God has done for them. Now, the second word that I mentioned that is important to see in this passage is the word holy. And uh, at least in the Bible, the word holy is used kind of sparingly to designate certain things from other things. Okay? It is meant to separate something from one category into another. It's meant to lift something up out of all the ordinary things into something different. And whenever something in the scriptures is called holy, it is being separated for God, for his purposes. And what is the purpose? A lot of times people don't go so far as describe the purpose. The purpose of anything in the scriptures that is described as holy is to make room for God in this world. Okay? God is continually invading this world. Someday heaven and earth will be together. So those things are, that are holy are meant to make room for God in this world here. Now, here's one of the problems with the word holy. If you've been around church for a while, uh, it's almost like this religious adjective that's thrown on anything to make someone sound spiritual or mature. I can remember when I was in college, I was in a Bible study, and all of us, we, knew, we didn't know what we were doing. So we had this Bible study. We were all kind of young believers. And this one guy that was in our group was, was working on learning to pray. And I'll say this before I make fun of him. There's never a bad way to pray, okay? But if you pray this way, your pastor will make fun of you, okay? So there's never a bad way to pray. <clears throat> He'd start praying, and every other word would be holy. Dear holy God. I'm thinking, that's true. Thank you for the Holy Bible. I'm thinking, that's true. And then he'd begin to say things like, thank you for this holy group and this holy group of guys. And I started looking around. I'm like, obviously, you don't know the other guys in this Bible study. <laughs> holy, holy, holy. The only to be interrupted with the word worthy from time to time. And I was just like, come on, man. He was learning to pray. We throw the word holy around 
way too frivolously. But there are certain things that really are holy. Do you know the church is holy? There's something about us together that lifts us up and separates us from other things. The nation of Israel is holy. The Sabbath is holy. Why is the Sabbath holy? It's meant to make room for God in your week, in the midst of your busyness. It's meant to make room for God in the midst of your work. The temple, which we'll look at next week, was meant to make space, physical space, for God in the world. The tithe is holy because it is meant to make room for God to work in the world. Not just in an external way, but also in an internal way. It is holy. It deserves its designation. It is set apart for the high purpose of helping bring about more of God in this space, in this world. So the tithe, a 10% belongs to God, used for his purposes in this world and in our heart. So that's the first principle, what we, what we, uh, what we give. The second principle, I'll do this one quickly. It's really easy to describe, and it's what we keep. So those that study money and giving in the scriptures will, are quick to make a distinction that there's a difference between what we call the tithe and there's a difference between what we call the offering. And the offering is meant to be something that's a free will offering that is meant to go beyond this baseline of the 10%. Now, the offering, if you read about in Scripture, a lot of people have questions. They get confused about it because it is much more nuanced. It's much more creative. It's much more spontaneous. But it is meant to be the type of giving that is described not as faithful, but as sacrificial. It's being moved to go beyond what you normally do. And a way to think about it is the offering is meant to be the type of giving that comes from answering this question. What do I keep? So the tithe answers the question, what do I give? The offering answers the question, what do I keep? So in Leviticus chapter 19, it's one of my favorite places. This is something that occurred in Israel's life every harvest. This is what it says. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap the very edges of the field of your field or gather the gleaning of your harvest. Do not go over the vineyard a second time or pick the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner, for I am the Lord your God. Everything in the field belonged to that, that, that owner, that farmer. But the Lord says, go through it one time. And there's always a certain amount that is left behind. And you can go back and take it. But I want you to think about what it is that you actually need. How much do you actually take? The Lord says, leave some behind so that people's needs could be met. Now, this is where I personally get challenged a lot today in my life. How much do I keep? How much do I leave behind? Like the tithe, this is a principle of generosity, and this one goes even beyond that baseline. Many of you love the story of Ruth in your Bibles. That brave lady, that, that widow, that foreigner in a strange place who was so loyal to her mother-in-law to care for her. Do you know what provided for Ruth and her family? It was the gleaning laws that we just read. She enters the field of Boaz, a faithful man who understood that even though he had all, the, all these things he could take from all of them, he was faithful to leave certain things behind and others would come and glean. Now, how does that principle get applied today in our culture? We don't have fields. We don't leave it behind for, for strangers and aliens to come and gather. But there are certainly ways if we begin to think about it that we answer that question, how much do I keep? Elise and I have the pleasure of... Um, meeting with young couples, uh, premarital couples, several times a year. And uh, we talk about the things that usually cause problems, family, sex, money. And when we get to the part about money, we, every time, every couple, we challenge them. Not only to honor God with their money, but to set goals of giving in the same way that they would set goals for saving and set goals to buy a house. We challenge them to set goals for their giving, to be intentional with all that they have. And we talk to them about what you keep and what you give. And we challenge them to grow in their marriage, to become more and more generous as time goes on. One of our commitments, or one of my goals personally, is that by the time I'm in my 60s, I'm a 20% giver. That is a personal goal of mine. It doesn't need to be everyone else's. But it is a goal of mine. And Dream Boulder, because that price tag is so big, is helping speed up that process for the Carlucci's. 
But this is one of those things that we go to God with and we let him challenge us and take us further and further. It's a very personal thing. Now, some of you are in the process of going through this commitment card and you're thinking about what it is that you give and what you want to increase. You want to use the principles of what I give and what I keep when you do this. So let me give you a couple examples. Uh, I've been meeting with people and uh, I met with a, a, a young man a few weeks ago and he said, I currently give about $500 a month. But I felt like the Lord gave me a number, and the Lord gave him the number 30,000, which was a big number for this, this young guy. And he said, well, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to continue to give my 500. I'm going to increase by 500 a month. That's 1,000 a month. I start doing the math in my head because I can't help myself. I'm like, all right, we're at 24 of the 30. And then he said, I have some savings that I want to give out of. And what he's doing is he's saying, this is above and beyond my 10%, but I believe that God wants me to, to, to give more out of my offering, more out of the excess. And so he is giving both from what? God asked them to give and what God asked them to keep. We have another couple here in the church. Two weeks ago, I met with them. They're faithful givers already, and they want to go beyond that. He just received a raise because he's really good at his job. He's donating his entire raise for two years as his offering. What I give and what I keep. Sacrificial giving, faithful giving, all of these things. Now, I need to begin to wrap up, but I want to say this. So this is what we give. This is what we keep. And let me tell you how God uses it. So because money is limited, it's hard to earn, wherever you give your money, it should be faithfully stewarded. And one thing that you'll never hear from us at Cornerstone is that all of your giving needs to come to us. You'll never hear that. We don't believe that. Even though we as a church give 10%, that's our starting place, we give You'll never hear from us. We usually encourage people, the same thing we encourage our families, is that you give to your church, you give to the spread of the gospel, and you give to the care for the poor and the vulnerable, acts of justice. Those are the things we think that we see in Scripture that people give to. And so we just encourage our people to be generous in those areas. But here's what happens when you do that. God takes the gift, and he turns it into a tool of his kingdom. Now, yes, God's kingdom is eternal. A lot of times it's invisible. It's breaking through in this, in this world. Sometimes it can be hard to, to describe or to, to measure it. But God uses temporary things like money and wealth to build an eternal kingdom. And so that is why that you see through history, after this law was given, God's people continually being faithful to use what they have as a tool, put it into God's hands so that he might use it. So 2 Chronicles chapter 31 is an example of this. In the Old Testament, Hezekiah comes in and rededicates the temple. They need to get things going again. And they ask the people to give. And look what it says. They gave a tithe of everything that they have. The same type of thing happened in Nehemiah. A great story that people love. Uh, Nehemiah and Ezra go back into the city. They rebuild the wall. They rebuild the temple. Well, how would they do it? With the tithe. And generous offerings that came on top of that. You get to the New Testament. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus recognizes women who funded his ministry. In Acts chapter 4, you see the church coming together to give to the physical needs of the poor within their own community, which is important to do. In Acts chapter 6, they come together and they use their money to care for the needs, the physical needs of those outside of the community, which is very important to do. Later on, Paul's missionary journeys, and just think of it this way, taking the gospel to people who don't hear it, don't have access to it, was funded by people's giving. Later on, Paul would say to the Roman church, Give to Phoebe so that she can go do and do the same thing that I've done for you. Since that time, the covenant people of God, whether it's been the Jewish family or the church, have built local synagogues, local churches. They've planted and established these things. They've made sure they've been healthy. They've cared for their facilities, their ministries, their vision. Jewish and Christian charities for centuries now have been started, like schools and hospitals, soup kitchens, homeless shelters, orphanages. Places where people's needs would be met. Look what they're doing. They're making room for God to work in the world through the tithe. It's a temporary tool that produces eternal um, outcomes and impact. Now, this is how I want to end. Worship team, you guys come out. I want it to appeal to us personally. The tithe makes room for God to work in the world. But this is how, what I want us to hear as we leave. The tithe makes room for God to work in our hearts. I started off by describing how complicated our relationship is with money. 
Jesus understood this more than anyone. And, um, you know, we often say this here, but the, the, the subject that he taught on, the second most was money. The only thing he taught on more was the kingdom. Kingdom first, but then he talked about money because he knew that money, in many ways, would be a great tool to build the kingdom, but it would also, if it got people's hearts, be a hindrance to building the kingdom. He also knew that it, when money gets into our heart, it can make us very, very sick, and life can become unsatisfying. Money can become an idol. Few things in life can lure us to exchange serving God, loving God, trusting God more than money can. Now, the Bible calls these things idols, anything we love, trust, and serve more than God, the thing we can't imagine our life without. And so because of all this, Jesus talked about money in a cautionary way. Be careful. Be careful. You can't serve both God and money. Be careful. He never said money is bad. But what he described is this thing of, called mammon. And here's one of the most important things to ever know about money. Money is not bad, but when money gets a grip on our heart and it's the thing we love, trust, and serve the most, it becomes what Jesus described as mammon, which is an over-love, over-trust, over-service for money. And this is the idol of the, our age. It's probably the idol of their age as well. And anytime there is an idol in your life, it will disappoint you. It won't just let you down. The foundation of your life will crumble before you at some point. And so he said, be careful. When money becomes something that we use to honor God and love people with, it becomes a testimony of who you live for. Few things in your life to the people who are closest to you will show your devotion to someone more than the way you give. Now, people don't need to know where it goes, but few things will. I have a friend. He's 77 years old. And I meet with him once a month. He's a mentor. And he was asking me a couple weeks ago, he said, Brian, what are you going to teach on next? And I said, oh, I have the pleasure of getting to teach my church about money because every pastor loves to do that. And uh, he started laughing at me. He said, well, that'll be weird. And I said, I'll probably, uh, but I'll do my best. And he said, um, he was telling me in his 30s, he was a, a new believer. And he had two children and he was an admissions officer at the University of Colorado and he had lots of bills and lots of pressure. And a friend pulled him aside one day and said, hey, have you learned to honor God with your money? He said, what does that mean? He's, and, he, and his friend said, well, it starts with 10%, and then God wants you to build on it past that. And he heard the 10%, and at the time, this friend of mine said, I was giving 2%, and 10% sounded painful. And I said, it didn't sound painful. It is painful at times. It's like cutting something off. And uh, he he said, you know, so I prayed about it with my wife, but I really wanted to demonstrate not just to myself, but to our family, that our family lived for the Lord. And so he said, we started giving 10%, and then he got quiet, and he began to weep in a chair in this public setting. He began to weep. And he said, in the years that would follow, he said, the two things, there were two things that really proved his family's devotion, honor, service, love of God, to their, to their boys, him and his wife's love and care for God. Uh, two things really proved it to their sons, and one of them was learning to give faithfully. He said, still to this day, my grown sons say, God, thank you, or say to the dad, thank you for teaching us that. My mom taught me, meant to learn it from our families. Sometimes that doesn't happen, so we learn it here. But it became a testimony to his entire family of what truly was in their heart. Now, one last thing, and then I'll close. I want to tell you my favorite story of all about giving, and it has to do with my oldest son, Cole, who I'm very proud of for many, for many reasons, inc including making it to the state wrestling tournament <laughs> two weeks ago, which was very cool. So our family's been trying to teach our boys about giving, what we keep and what we give since they were really little, since they first started getting birthday money. And um, it's kind of the same thing. Do I really have to, Dad? And then I kind of pile it on because I just really want them to know the cost. I'm like, since you're giving this, you can't buy this Star Wars ship. And they're like, oh, no. Well, then I'm not giving. And where I'm trying to teach the boys that there are certain things that we learn to prioritize. You can't say yes to everything. And so I was just hoping that it would stick. And about a year and a half ago, every, you, many of you know that every May we do this thing called the Red Envelope Fund where we fund uh, scholarships for kids to go to camp. It's really a neat thing. And uh, Elise and I uh, give to that every year. 
By the way, that's part of the one fund right now. Um, well, one Sunday evening after I was done preaching, I get into the car, and Cole gets in the car with me, and he throws down a red envelope. And it wasn't like $5 or $6. It was a pretty good amount. And I said, hey, buddy, mom and dad already got one of those. And he said, well, this one's mine. And I said, this one's yours. And he said, yep, getting another kid to camp. Really proud. <laughs> and I didn't have the heart to tell him that camp cost a whole lot more than the number on that envelope. But I didn't want to rob him of his joy. But I looked at him and I said, good job, buddy. And then he said a couple of other things. And I looked over at him. And Cole just had this smile on his face. And it wasn't the smile like I just got something that I wanted. It was the smile of joy. Because one of the results of being a giver, of honoring God, putting others above yourself, is joy. And that's the one thing in life most people are chasing. And the world tells us to find it in all the wrong places. But in the kingdom of God, everything is upside down. You find your life by giving it away. So I was proud of my son for being faithful, but you know what I was most excited about is that he had experienced real joy that comes through giving it away. All right, we need to end. Let me pray. Father, I uh, just want to bless this, this message. Most of all, Lord, I want to bless all the time of prayer and the discussions that are taking place within our church for the next few weeks as people consider how they might give. We pray for your voice. We pray for your voice to speak through your scriptures. We pray for your spirit voice to speak specifically to people about what it is that you're calling them to do. Lord, I pray for unity uh, within marriages. I know this can be hard. I pray that you would provide a way for couples to come together on this. For those that are filled with fear, I pray, God, that they would trust you We pray for just a, a responsible, generous response to what you're doing. And Lord, that's why I'm really, really excited about our number one goal, which is 100% participation during this project. The number matters much less than all of us. And so I ask that you would do what only you can do, and that is to speak to each one of us in your way that we might hear. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.